Startup Alley, and I am with uh, two folks uh, who might be familiar to you, uh, but know a lot about the future of finance. Can I say it that way? The future of finance, the future of money. Money, the, the, money. Broad term. the, the future of yeah. currency. Uh, Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss yes. of Winklevoss Capital, and soon a uh, regulated Bitcoin exchange. That's right. Gemini. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the idea of uh, what uh, a regulated Bitcoin exchange would be and why that's necessary if Bitcoin is actually going to be a, a standardized form of currency. Yeah, so right now there's no way to buy Bitcoin in the U.S. from a regulated license exchange. So uh, you pretty much have to buy it in a dark pool or offshore. And so what really, does dark pool mean? Dark pool is basically like over-the-counter network. Like I call you up and say, hey, I'm looking for a right. thousand Bitcoins. You say, sure, I'll sell it to you at this price. But so it's, that's not illegal. It's just It's not illegal, it's just... but it's, it's unclear. You have to take risk. I have to trust you. You have to trust me. And there's a lot of friction to it. Uh -huh. um, basically, Bitcoin doesn't have like a NASDAQ, an ability, like a spot market to buy and sell Bitcoin easily. And that's really what we believe is a critical piece of the infrastructure missing. So for any Bitcoin business that needs to buy Bitcoin to you know, do what they're doing, um, we think it's really important both um, to have that for the businesses, but also for consumers who want to buy it in a safe environment. I mean, there's a lot of um, like institutions won't do business with a company that's not licensed. So there is no license on ramp into Bitcoin in America. So 80% of the trading activity is happening in China. So we want to build regulated on ramps with Gemini, with our ETF, so that people can get in the game because most of the people are sitting out on the sidelines right now. So that's basically you know, the, the concept there. I think that that's certainly from, from what I know of Bitcoin and definitely people that I know who aren't really in technology. They're just like, oh, yeah. that's like a hacker thing where you have to buy a bunch of computers and move stuff out of your living room and, right. and, and mine Bitcoins all day. I think that, that there, there is sort of that barrier to entry where it for seems sure. like, oh, this is something for people who are really good at the underbelly of computing. Now, if something's regulated on an exchange, right. it, takes, it takes all that friction out of the, out of the equation, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, I think definitely. And it also takes the risk. So if you're a Bitcoin business and you're buying um, Bitcoin offshore from an exchange that's unregulated or it's unclear you know, what the inner workings is, you're taking on a lot of risk to do that. Yeah. Um, the casual user you know, may eventually never actually touch Bitcoin or, or see it. Um, they're just doing transactions and Bitcoin underpins it, um, making it you know, freer, cheaper basically, and uh, more instantaneous. But businesses are going to have to touch Bitcoin um, and take custody and hold it and buy it and do things like that. And, um, and right now there's a ton of friction to do that. Um, and that's sort of the irony because Bitcoin's supposed to be frictionless and make things better. Um, but we're getting there, yeah. Is the idea really, you know, there's, there, there are some kinks to work out for sure, but is the idea that for anyone who says, well, okay, Bitcoin virtual payment, if I'm paying uh, a variety of my bills through my bank online, right. I've never seen that money, what's really right. the difference? Is the idea to get rid of exchange rates yeah. all over the world so we just have one? So it's not like, oh, the euro's doing better against the dollar. Will that just all go away eventually if Bitcoin succeeds? I think... I think there's a lot of friction between going in between currencies, but I mean, the way we look at Bitcoin is it's, it's internet money. It's money built specifically for the internet and current forms of money like credit card, ACH, current forms of payments um, were built in the 50s and 60s before the internet existed. So right. using them on the internet is like a square peg in a round hole. It, it sort of works, but it'll never quite work as well as let's say um, email as sending a parcel now we send email. Instead of uh, long distance uh, phone calls, we, uh, voice goes over the internet now. So you have mail going over the internet, you have voice going over the internet, the and now finally we internet. have money going over the internet. And Bitcoin is data packets over the internet. It's money yeah. uh, over, over the internet protocol. So I think that you know, it's the last piece of the internet that would have been invented um, in the earliest days of the internet had the computer science breakthroughs occurred to make that possible. That didn't happen until 2009. Uh, otherwise, Bitcoin as a money protocol would have been built in, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. So it just took this long to get here. But there's a certain inevitability about it that's always been there, and I think there's always been an intention. It just wasn't feasible technologically. Yeah. And speaking. I think I think to your your point, there's no sort of borderless money out there. 
other than Bitcoin. Ability to go across borders instantaneously, low friction, low cost. Um, you know, right now it's a, you know the financial system is sort of very fractured and Byzantine. Yeah. To, to move money from here to the United Kingdom, you have to go through the Fed wire and then Swift and then something over there, and it might take three days. And so there's a lot of problems. It's a very broken system. Um, so I think, you know, as Tyler said, there's an inevitability to Bitcoin. It was always going to happen, and it's happening now. Um, and I think people st are starting to see that and understand that. As far as the general tech divide, we hear a lot about that. Uh, you know, in emerging economies, there are certain technologies that completely skipped over, say, the U.S. or the U.K. Right. Because they have different needs. And when you sort of think about, I don't know, a cafe that just takes cash or uh, wire transfers, uh, you know, between here and a country in Central America, how does that divide look to you as Bitcoin continues to make strides? Right. So I think Bitcoin in many ways is more popular in places that need it the least. Like oh. credit cards in America aren't totally broken, right? It's not that painful to go buy a <laughs> cup of coffee with a credit card, right? Okay. It might be a little bit more expensive, but it's not super painful. And I don't think people wake up in the morning and say, gee, I, I wish I had Bitcoin to buy that cup of coffee. Right. But there's certain areas in the world, like Argentina, where the, the currency is being debased um, at somewhere like 25, 30% a year. So individuals getting paid in pesos are, are literally seeing their value evaporate um, almost instantaneously. And so it's places like that, it's broken economies, um, fiscal mismanagement, places where there's capital controls and it's hard to get um, funds in and out, um, where Bitcoin, I think, has a huge, very strong use case. I think remittance is another big one. Um, unless you have the pain of sending money from here to another country and, and feel the exchange rates there, um, you might not understand, like, how does Bitcoin change my life, but it's a serious pain point. Um, so I think Bitcoin, in, in that sense, um, is huge in, in the developing world and places where there's real problems. Um, I still think it's big in America, but um, maybe not as obvious at first glance to, to users on that point. Right, and the, to be honest, the thing holding America back is we don't have these regulated exchanges like what we're trying to build with Gemini so that people can keep their dollars onshore, not wire out to somewhere in Eastern Europe or Asia. Um, so we needed a home here and we still don't have one. And Bitcoin's been around since 2009. Um, regulators have talked about Bitcoin. Um, it's been on their radar for at least a few years. So it's been a long time coming. We think it's gonna be here soon. Um, and I think that that will be a game changer for Bitcoin, especially in the States. Well, best of luck with Gemini. Thank you. And thank you. Wink Capital. Cameron and Tyler Wink thanks for talking to us at TechCrunch TV and enjoy the show. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thanks for having us.